And Dr. Mai is not only a good friend of mine, but he is a, a, a fellow, uh, well, I guess not classmate, but a uh, schoolmate from SCCO. And uh, we were actually on the yearbook committee <laughs> together. And so it's, it's really fun to have him on. And uh, he works at Insight Vision Center. He not only grew his orthokeratology practice from scratch, but also his specialty lens practice as a whole. So this is truly a person that has said, you know what, here I am. I'm seeing patients, normal, traditional practice. And he totally pivoted and is now doing I mean, mostly specialty contact lenses. And it is tremendous to see the amount of growth that he has personally been able to achieve with myopia management over the course of just a few years. So thank you so much, Dr. Mai, for joining us. I cannot wait to hear about your lecture. Wow. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that introduction. And uh, I am happy to say this is my third time on Wu University. So I'm um, three-peating here. It, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like you go on SNL and you're like Justin Timberlake and they invite you back and it's like your fifth time. You get that jacket. I think there was like a, an episode where they had like where all the other guys that were on multiple times met up and uh, I feel like that now. So it's great. Um, this lecture is all about communicating myopia. I added this little tweak like a Jedi master. But again, I wanted to recap one small thing. Yes, Stephanie and I, she was one of my, she was my first optom optometric business partner. We had a yearbook together. It's like nine months of labor and then you give birth to a yearbook baby. Um, what we did was we did the marketing for it. We created it throughout the course of the year, took a bunch of pictures. And this is us in 2008. So uh, it's been a long journey. If you notice one thing about the picture is that Stephanie looks the same today as she did 13 years ago. So it's, uh, that's a, uh, it, to me, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. A little bit more about my practice. Uh, we opened cold in 2015, uh, saw, saw, you know, this is uh, us on, on the left picture. This is uh, opening grand opening party. We invited uh, everyone we knew you can tell by, all the Asian people that uh, I invited uh, every every person, uh, me and my partner could could possibly email and, and beg to come. So we did. Um, one of uh, the people in the audience is Jaime, and he was he's a, he's in this picture somewhere, but he's a he was one of our first staff members. The picture on the right is our uh, the picture that we took just a few months ago with our staff now. So we opened Cold in 2015 with uh, just um, one or two staff, and now we have a team of over 20. And we focus entirely on specialties, special contact lenses, orthokeratology, myopia management, and vision therapy. Now, I, I, I started the slides and started the lecture out by saying that I want you to communicate like a Jedi master. And if you have the impression that I'm going to give you the magic words, which will, you know, have patients understand exactly what you mean and have them pursue myopia management afterwards, I want to give a slight caveat in that I think the exact words you use and what you say actually in the exam room doesn't matter very much actually. And that the decision to, to pursue your, to join your practice and join your myopia management program and treat their children, sometimes actually many times that decision is made even before they've even met you. And so I want to talk a lot about that communication that happens even before they even set foot in your office, because that's part of the entire spectrum of communication that you're going to have with your patients. So I'll give you an example. Most of our patients are going to find us and they see our story and read what we're about based on what they see online first or what their friends tell them when, they have, when they're having dinner conversations with their buddies who have children the same age. So what they do is they're going to look at your reviews online. They're going to read the reviews online. So for instance, this is one that was written earlier this year. You know, she had a 10 year old daughter. She's doing orthokeratology and it also helped prevent her myopia from progression from progressing. And we are very grateful, highly recommend this practice. Um, the reason why that's so important is two things. First of all, uh, you should be asking for reviews. If you ask for, for re reviews, uh, then 
you're going to get more reviews. There's a good saying that I love. It's uh, you don't get what you ask, what you, you don't get what you deserve in life. You get what you ask for. So we automatically ask all of our patients to review us. And in additionally, when my myopia counselor takes over and is talking to the patients, they might be, uh, they might ask the patient if they know any other friends or family, go ahead and recommend us. And so this patient gets, understands the story that she's doing orthokeratology, but mainly I like the fact that she didn't mention that it, it was mainly for vision correction. She mentioned that it has helped, it has prevented her myopia from progressing and we are grateful. That is our main takeaway when we're, we're the communicating myopia management with orthokeratology, for instance. I don't talk about seeing clearly when they wake up in the morning. I don't talk about um, great vision for sports first. That comes later. The first thing I talk about is myopia. And the first thing I talk about is axial length. And I talk about how we need to stop that from getting worse. So I encourage you to, to move away from doing orthokeratology for children, mainly in, in discussing vision correction and, and being stuck on seeing 2020 and talking more about the myopia progression you're trying to stop and the axial length of the eye. This is a picture we took on Halloween with uh, uh, Rapunzel here and uh, you know, taking pictures and sharing it on social media and posting it to your website is a big part of your communication because parents are researching everything you do online first. When they walk to the office, they already know quite a bit about you and they're savvier today than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. They already have an idea of what they want. And sometimes they come to you and they tell you what they, what they want you to do. <laughs> That's the parent at uh, the new age moms that we're getting today. And, uh, and you have to evolve to that, to that level of communication and that expectation. The website that you have also needs to communicate and explain things as well. And so for instance, we have a page on our website about orthokeratology. I would encourage you as part of your myopia communications to have videos, teaching insertion and removal, for instance, showing testimonial, showing that social proof that other people love your practice as well, and posting that throughout your website, posting that to your YouTube page, having a litany of patients just telling the world how great you are. And that helps to tell the story of, of what you do and, and how uh, you're someone that could be trusted when they see real people talking about what you do and are appreciative about it. In addition to orthokeratology, because some people, when they're learning about myopia, as, as you communicate it, you need to communicate your myopia management through your website as well and talk about uh, myopia, how you can manage it, create videos as well as written content. So when you do your communication, some of it is going to be written. Some people, in, some people like to read. Some people are not readers and they are auditory learners. So you need to have videos where they can listen. And uh, the videos as well are visual so they can see you talking about it and also see your face. If they meet you ahead of time and see you ahead of time, then they trust you a little bit more. And that trust is so important when you're trying to communicate the need for myopia management. And then that kind of shows the whole world on the street. You have a, you're communicating constantly through your website, through your social media pages, you're communicating to your patients, through just the, even the text, automated text messages that you send to patients before they come to the office, the post-examination, post-consultation emails and, and phone calls. You're always communicating to patients before and after they even set foot in your office. So don't forget about all that communication because this mom here, this mom here, we do a lot of com uh, consumer research, especially with our triage eye centers. And uh, when we do a lot of our, our consumer research, we know that a lot of our patients are like this mom. She's not even listening to what the doctor is trying to tell her. <laughs> I found this picture because that was great. This mom is not going to listen to anyone. She is going to already decide what she wants to do. And so she decides you're the right person based off all the things she's reading online about the science. She's going to come in and, and bring in uh, research articles and studies. She's going to come in already knowing that she wants to do orthokeratology. She's going to come in knowing she already wants to do atropine. She already comes in knowing she wants to do custom soft multifocal lenses. The beauty is that I believe that something is always better than nothing. If a patient is dead stuck on doing atropine and has, that has nothing, has no, they, they, don't, they want no part of doing orthokeratology, for instance, I'm fine with it because something is always better than nothing and patients do well either in atropine or orthokeratology.
But again, know that mom has already done her research. So give her ammunition, give her the story of, and communicate what you do and how you do it through your online presence first before she even sets foot in your office. Send her an email before she comes into the office explaining what you expect to happen at your office and what you want her to bring with her. After you do your communication with online, social media, et cetera, you need to communicate internally first before you even venture to practice and perfect how you communicate and discuss things with the patient themselves. So your internal communication first starts with a deep belief that you believe that myopia is a disease. If you don't believe that it is a disease as consequential as treating, let's say, glaucoma, which is a, we know as a progressive eye disease that leads to um, permanent vision loss, glaucoma does. Now, if you believe that with myopia, you, you will not just subtly and quietly recommend myopia management to patients. You're going to tell patients this is not something they should think about. You're going to think about as if it's a disease, like a doctor that you're going to prescribe treatment for, that you want to bring them back to do further testing, that you're going to pursue treatment and follow up appropriately so they're managed correctly over the course of time. And so first you need to start with your internal monologue. And that's, I think, where most doctors uh, fail. It's not the failure of their equipment. It's not the failure of having the right staff. It's not the failure of the patient who just doesn't get it or just doesn't want to pay for it. It's a failure most of the time in the fact that you don't believe that myopia is a, is a disease worth treating. And know that people don't buy what you do or how you do it. They buy what you believe in. And so start with that first. Then afterwards, um, the next communication you do after you've convinced yourself that it's something you need to do uh, and that you need to do it well, otherwise refer out, is your staff. You need to have multiple staff trainings where you discuss why myopia is a problem how it's an epidemic, and how you are the best office in the world to control and manage myopia in these children. And so I would start next with a lecture at least or an internal uh, training with your staff. This is uh, you know, one of my lectures. I call it Think Big for Little Eyes. And I give this lecture to my staff. And when my staff is hired new, we've hired over 10 people in, uh, since COVID has begun. And uh, we are training them from the very beginning about how myopia is an epidemic and we're communicating why it's a problem. So you need to communicate with your staff. Uh, most people who try to dabble in myopia and not go all in, they don't have, a, uh, they don't also don't assign a resident staff expert. I recommend having at least one staff person be that expert. And then that also having that person that's dedicated, sort of like having a surgical coordinator communicates to the patient that this is what you do and that this is what you are known for. So the patient's also watching for signs that you're not just dabbling, that you're so on that, oh, this is the place for my kid. This isn't just a place that just kind of does it here and there. This is the place to go. And parents will go to the ends of the earth to find the best place for their kids. Now, I want to talk about a little bit about like a little, I call it, the, you know, jab, 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 right hook sort of thing, where essentially a patient might not know anything about myopia. They don't realize it's even a problem. They think, ah, oh, I just wear a pair of glasses. What's the big deal? You know, so that's a major hurdle in terms of why people are not doing myopia management. Know that um, if they knew what you knew, then they probably would do myopia management, right? So the problem is they don't know what you know. So your job is to teach them what you know, because so, if they do, then you're go they're going to follow through. So for instance, what we do if you, before they even come to the office is we send them emails, videos, eBooks, things like that, so that they learn about what we do and why. When they call us, you know, the, fr the first thing we do is we try to trap the phone call and direct it to a resident myopia expert. Someone that's on the staff, that's the expert in talking and communicating about myopia management. So maybe it's you in the very beginning. If you're opening an office cold from scratch like me, where I had one staff and one patient a day, that expert was me. I would have the staff just say, oh, Dr. Mai will talk to you about it. And when you're communicating on that phone call, I recommend you say this. Let's say a patient calls and asks for orthokeratology, or they heard about those weird eye drops that stop the eyes from getting worse from their friend. Or they heard about my site from a commercial they saw 
from Cooper Vision, I would always say this. Oh, yes, you called the right place. Our practice is the best when it comes to what they asked for. So if they say, uh, I'm here because I uh, am interested in orthokeratology, I, would, I wouldn't say, oh, yes, our, pay, our practice is the best for myopia control. They didn't say that. They didn't ask for myopia control. They asked for orthokeratology. So I would say, oh, yes, you're right. Our practice is the best when it comes to orthokeratology. So whatever they ask for, you just say it. You repeat back what they say. That's a really effective way to show that um, you are also listening to the patient. Because if you're repeating back what they just told you, it stands to reason that you heard what they said. If you heard what they said, then understand. It, 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 it's reasonable to say that you might understand the solution from then on. And so whenever they say, when I, it's, you know, I, I'm here for scleral lenses. I'm here because I have keratoconus. Just say, oh my gosh, our practice is the best for keratoconus. You came to the right place. Our practice is the best for orthokeratology. You came to the right place. I recommend sending a preparatory email and communicate what you do before they come in for the consultation, before they come in for the eye exam. So I'll, I'll give you an example. We have one. You can see the whole thing. It's just three minutes. I won't play it here. But if you go to YouTube and just search uh, Insight Vision Center Optometry, um, one of our videos is called What to Expect During Your Myopia Management Consultation. We send this video to every patient before they come in because one of one thing I've learned from doing public speaking, one thing that my mentors have taught me, for instance, is you have to tell people, tell them what you told them, and tell them again. And so when it comes to something new, we like to send them an email, we like to tell them over the phone, and then during the consultation, we tell them again, essentially why, why we need to do what we do. It's kind of like building the case. If you're a lawyer, you're building the case in terms of why we need to arrive at this conclusion. In addition to that, video because some people enjoy videos honestly not a lot of our patients are going to click on this video they might get the email but they're not going to actually click and watch it maybe let's say 20 30 percent some of them might be visual learners maybe they might like to read things so for instance we might send them an ebook this is one that we wrote about protecting children's vision um or you might send them a white paper or you don't do this something fancy like this, like writing a white uh, an ebook like we did. Maybe you send them an email, just has a little bit of information, some links back to your website, something. Remember, perfect is always the enemy of good. Doing something and giving them a little bit of information is, is at least better than doing nothing. If they walk into your office cold, that's kind of the term, right? Like, kind of like a cold prospect. If they walk in cold and they've never, you've never communicated the need for myopia management, why it's a problem, what the consequences are of not pursuing treatment. It's, it, it's understandable that a patient would be confused and wouldn't follow through. What, how your office is designed, how your office looks, how you've, uh, what is on your walls, how have you presented yourself, the images that you have, the branding that you have in your office is a big part that communicates to a patient that this is what we do, and this is what we are great at. So for instance, we want patients to know that we treat kids. We want patients to know that we treat uh, young patients and we are well-equipped to handle uh, the patients at that, at that age group. Our bathrooms have special seats that little children and toddlers can sit on that, you know, that slide down, right? So the kids don't have to, the mom doesn't have to uh, hold the kid on the seat. Uh, we have those little things. We have a changing station, a diaper changing station in our bathrooms so parents that bring in children can change their babies in our bathrooms conveniently and comfortably. We have a room that looks like a treehouse because kids like and think treehouses might be cool. We have a sign outside our door that uh, we have five exam lanes and one of them just has a sign outside of it that says, we think big for little eyes. And so it is part of our message. What people see helps to communicate, because again, this lecture is all about communication. This is the nonverbal communication that tells a story in terms of what you do and why. That, that again, studies show that probably most of the communication we do is nonverbal. It's not about what you say sometimes, it's, it's how you say it, your tone of voice, but even just how you gesture, your body language, how you're dressed. 
wearing a white coat, for instance, studies are shown again and again, patients actually trust the white coat. It, it shows that uh, you're someone to be trusted. Even if, even if, for instance, if my technician walked into the door wearing a white coat, but I walked in wearing a t-shirt, every patient would think the technician is the doctor and then I'm just some guy <laughs> that showed up. So know that the nonverbal communication is very important. This is an example of one of our staff. Our staff, we do, we do offer and we buy their clothes for them. We have a uniform because we want to always convey a clean message. We do wear certain attire in the room to communicate that we are doctors and that we are someone to, that is a trusted medical expert because your novel, your nonverbal communication is so important. I, I, I'm doing a Zoom meeting right now. This is virtual, but I'm wearing this suit and I, 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 I spent 60 seconds putting on this nice dress shirt and this little jacket because I know that if I look a little bit smarter, maybe you'll think I am smarter. And uh, I fooled you. But uh, at least this is the nonverbal communication you've gotten from me that I'm not just some guy who wore a t-shirt and that's all ripped with a bunch of holes in it. This adds a little bit more credibility, especially because um, you know we, we might all have a little bit of imposter syndrome. What are the sounds in your office? What do they communicate? Are you playing rap music and heavy metal? Is it nature bird calls? Are you playing Disney uh, music all, all day long? What is it? Because the sounds in your office communicates what kind of office you have as well. Do we work with kids? Are we kind of more serious, more medical? And that's fine. The goal is to choose though. When you're converting the primary care exam to myopia management, keep the communication short and simple. So what I mean by that is this. Um, you want to avoid over explaining at the primary care exam. Don't, don't tell them about the, all the options. I remember I was listening to the Q and a with Jeff Walleen and Steph, uh, Steph Wu just earlier. And, um, he was mentioning how, like, um, do you, one of the questions was, do you go over all the options or not? Or do you just tell the patient what you think they should do? Tell the patient what you, they, you think they should do. They came to you for that answer. When you're communicating things, the patient just wants to know what you recommend because you're the expert. They want to know your level of certainty because at the end of the day, the person that's most certain is the person that's, that's you know, we're going to go along with that person's um, uh, suggestions. When you're talking about myopia management, let's say the patient comes in and they came in for a regular eye exam. They had VSP, I meant. They just want a pair of glasses. Kid failed the school screening, minus two. Now they're minus three. If you start launching into, oh my gosh, uh, we have to measure axial length and uh, there's this contact lens, you sleep at nighttime, it's gonna be great. You know, don't worry about it. It, it only costs $3,000. <laughs> like they're gonna be like, whoa, 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 what is this? I came in for just a pair of glasses. So remember, remember when you communicate, you always need to address their chief complaint. If their chief complaint was not, I'm here for myopia management, for you to be recommending that seems kind of salesy, doesn't it? So what I would suggest instead is this. Um, yes, you came in for a pair of glasses um, and I'm gonna give you a pair of glasses to help you see better. That's why you came in. But I'm a little concerned if we don't do anything, it might get worse. Let's have you back and let's talk about ways and things we can do to stop little Johnny's eyes from getting any worse. Like just something brief like that. Just, just something that's just 20, 30 seconds. Then at the consultation in a couple of weeks, your communication could be like, yes, now we are here to talk about things that we can do to stop it from getting worse. Now the chief complaint matches what you might recommend and prescribe at the end of the eye exam. The match makes sense. And the first, and similarly, the first primary care exam, you recommend glasses. They, they're asking for glasses. You gave them glasses. It all kind of makes sense. When you're scheduling the patient, never squeeze in the eye exam. Because if you rush, it communicates how much you care about the patient. It communicates uh, to them that this is a place that, if, that, that won't answer my questions. Because guess what? Mom is going to have a bunch of questions. <laughs> if you squeeze it in and you're rushing off to the next patient because you got 15 minutes, the patient is going to feel like, ah, oh, well, this place is, uh, you know, it communicates to me that this place doesn't quite, uh, is, is, is going to service my needs. It's not going to answer the questions that I have. It's not going to tell me like, why did we, why are we doing this? I read about doing this other thing online instead with, uh, 
you know, with special eye exercises that I read online, the base method, you know, you, you need to answer their questions in order to do so, you need to book the amount of time that's proper. Next thing is now, now we're getting to the meat of it. Now we're going to talk about the actual consultation itself. And when you first signed up for this lecture from this crazy guy, Dr. Todd Mai, you might have thought, oh yeah, this is why I'm here to talk about the special Jedi master language that I'm going to say during the consultation to get patients to, to sign up for myopia management. But just know again, all that work is done. The work that you do ahead of time, sometimes is more important. Sometimes the patient walks in already knowing they're going to do it before you even open your mouth based off what they've read online, especially if they are referred by a friend. What the friend has told them is more important than what you, what you have told them because <laughs> they trust their friend. So, but anyways, now we're going to go into the consult itself and a few tips for the consult itself. Know that people are emotional. We are not logical beings. If, if we knew, if they knew what you knew logically about myopia management, they would do it. But the reason why they don't do it is because a lot of emotions get in the way. Um, know that there's a good analogy called the elephant and the rider. So the rider is on top of the elephant and he's whipping the elephant to tell the elephant where to go, right? But the elephant ultimately decides where to go because <laughs> the elephant is much stronger and heavier than the little rider. So the little rider is your, your, the logic brain, but the, the emotional part of your brain is what's really going to drive your decisions more so. People hate to be sold, but they also at the same time love to buy. I'll give you another example. There's no secret in terms of getting a six pack, in terms of six pack abs and a, an amazing healthy body. You know, we know that eating right and, eat, and, eat, and exercising more is good for us. The reason why it doesn't happen though, is because even though we logically know that we shouldn't be eating 10 donuts a day, when we see those 10 donuts a day, guess what? The elephant wins, not the rider. The same thing is true when you're communicating anything in optometry and especially myopia management. When you're doing your communication, talk at a third grade level. That, that, that's my favorite level to be. I think if you speak at a third grade level, it also means you understand very well what you're talking about. Because most people, they've never heard about it before, but if you're able to explain it so well that a 10-year-old can follow exactly what you're doing and why, to me, you've done a great job at presenting your case. Also know about the goldfish rule. The goldfish rule is actually similar to what I heard from Jeff, Wallin, and Steph earlier that people have the attention span of a flea. That's what I think Jeff was saying. I say people have the attention span of a goldfish, but basically the same thing. It is very hard for someone to listen to you lecture about why they need to do what you want them to do. So whenever I'm making recommendations, I don't go over my recommendation for more than a minute. Usually it's 15, 30 seconds at a time. And then I wait and see what they have to say. So I have a dialogue, not a monologue because I know that people have the attention span of a goldfish. This is, this is nothing to do with anything. These, these are my two kids. They also have the attention span of a goldfish, <laughs> but uh, I, I, this is a good break slide. But, but this toy is great. It's like a lion and you feed balls into the lion's mouth and it comes down to the bottom. They pick up the ball, they feed it back into the mouth and it's an endless loop that can keep them entertained for 10 minutes so that both parents can regain their sanity. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, it's a great toy. This is a picture of my, my kids playing with it earlier this week. The younger one is Kinsey. The older one is Jackson. Um, one thing though, since we're talking about myopia management, what, 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 th what do you notice is wrong with this picture? What is very wrong with this picture? I'll tell you what's wrong with this picture is that I'm a bad parent and that you can tell that it's clearly daytime that these kids are playing inside during the day. They should be outside playing this game. So anyways, I need to, I need to, I need to get better at that. Um, so during the consultation itself, you want to, of course, ask some pertinent history. You want to ask for a history. You need to ask the patient, well, is there any history of myopia in the family? How high? How much time do they spend outside? How much screen time do they have? You want to communicate and ask these things because it will matter once you start building the case for why you need to do myopia management again. I call this the million dollar doctor consult is the first step is you should develop a little bit of rapport 
before you jump in and start communicating and recommending things. Ask problem, ask questions in order to dig into the problem. Review your findings, recommend your solution, answer all the questions, and then close and get coffee. It, it, that, that, that last part is a joke. But I, I never watched this movie, but I saw this clip called uh, from like Alec Baldwin, and he's like talking about coffee is for closers. I've never seen that movie, but I thought it was hilarious. And I know it's like a dig on capitalism. You don't want to be that cutthroat, but uh, at the end of the day, you do have to ask if the patient wants to do what you ask them to do at the end of the day. Um, so how to develop rapport. So um, if I, when I walk into the exam lane, I don't walk in and just go, oh my gosh, um, he's a minus two on the auto refractor. Uh, he was a minus one last year on my exam. Uh, put your head right in this uh, slit lamp and let me look at your eyes. Okay, okay, great. Uh, let's do this. You know, you want to <laughs> slowly develop rapport before you do anything. By developing rapport, it helps you powerfully communicate what you're going to recommend next. And patients are more likely to listen to you because you develop that rapport first. I like to, um, a lot of the concepts I, I, I use, I, I stole from this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It is one of the best books I've ever read in my life. And it, it honestly changed my life. Um, but the first thing you would do is, you know, if the patient's really like low energy and yes, uh, you know, uh, my kid is here now. We all have those patients. I wouldn't be like, oh my gosh, we got to do all these things. Oh my gosh, good to see you. Uh, I'm so happy you're here. That doesn't match their tonality or their appearance whatsoever. I would talk also though. I'd be like, oh, well, good to see you. Let's talk about what we need to do for little Johnny. I've matched their tone. I've, I've, I've mirrored them a little bit in, in their body language as well, hopefully. If they're really amped up, I'm like, oh my gosh, good to see you. And they're like, yes, yeah, good to see you too. I'd be at the same level. Because again, that's the platinum rule. The golden rule is treat people the way you want to be treated. But that's not good enough. You shouldn't treat people the way you want to be treated. You should treat people the way they want to be treated. And that is the platinum rule. So I'd mirror them a little bit. I would address them by their name. And ideally, every person in the room. So I'd say, hi, little Johnny. And then, hi, mom, Nancy. And hi, dad, Frank. I would call everyone there by name and I do it repeatedly. To me, it's just natural now. It just, it just comes out. I just say, well, Nancy, da, 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 da. And Frank, da, 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 da. I just, I'm always addressing them by their name because it acknowledges who they are. And uh, the, the sound of a person's name is the most beautiful word in the human language to them. And I always focus on the patient first and not the parent. So when I walk into the room, I don't, I walk in and I talk to little Johnny first and about why little Johnny is here. I don't walk into the room and be like, mom, tell me about little Johnny. Because um, again, I like to focus on the patient, make sure they feel that uh, they're in charge of the situation, that they're not scared about what's going to happen. Because again, these are little kids. I show them pictures of things because once you communicate things, you, people, most people are actually, what you tell them goes in one ear and out the other. So I talk about eyeballs. I talk about, this one on the right, that's uh, my epic. Eyeball is a little bit longer than it needs to be, or my eyes too big, too big, too long. That's the problem. That's it. I don't go into words like axial length. I don't talk about refractive error. I, I don't even use your word myopia right off the bat. I just say eyeball is too big. That's why he can't see far away. That third grade language patients get, I might show them where I think the vision might be if we don't do anything. This is the Brian Holden calculator, for instance. Plug in patient's uh, ethnicity, age, refractive error, and what you're going to do about it. And uh, you can show them if you do something about it, we might control uh, little Johnny's eyes, who is a minus two and a half now, instead of becoming a minus four, might be, instead of being a minus eight, hopefully we can get him down to minus four. And so again, it's important to show people things, not just tell them. So they can kind of understand what you're doing. By asking questions and showing them the depth of the problem. So now let's say you lay out the case that the eyeball is longer. How you, you know it's longer? You've measured the axial length and now you're telling them eyeball is a little bit long for his age. You've, you've, you've showed them what it could be. They don't do anything about it. The goal of that is because you need to show them that there is a problem that needs to be fixed. If they don't think that it's a problem, then they will never seek a solution because we only try to solve problems. We don't just do things just randomly. And so this is important to build the case and show them, communicate to them. If you knew what I knew, you would do something about it. 
when you recommend solutions, know that people, especially when something is novel and new, when something is novel and new, and you try to talk to them about it, sometimes it's very hard to understand it. It's an abstract thought to them. Orthokeratology is very abstract. It's, it, 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 what is it even? You know, even as an optometrist student, I was like, what is that even? How does that even work? Um, and so if you, in fact, if I thought that way as an optometry student, the patient does as well. So one thing we like to do is we compare it to an analog that they do understand. Because when something is confusing, you try to link it to something they, they already know. If, if Then they're like, oh, I understand how that is. Then yes, now I can understand what you do. So for instance, braces is a good one. It involves similar patient base ages. It involves uh, something that is honestly out of pocket most of the time. It's a specialty within dentistry. And just similarly, my way of management and orthokeratology is sometimes a doctor that just has a little more training and understanding of it than their regular primary care optometrist, for instance. And so it makes sense. Patients get it. When you recommend a solution, you might say, you know, I'm very concerned that if we don't do anything about it, it will continue to do so. It's just very, very simple language like that. You're going to answer any questions and uh, overcome any of their objections by talking about uh, and explaining things very succinctly. And also, for instance, I'll give you an example. Question could be, is it safe? Now, you could say this. Oh, yes, it is safe. Based on the Bullimore studies, uh, you know, 7.9 or 13.3 patients out of every 10,000 uh, suffered from microbial keratitis. You know, that, that, that is the numbers. Or yes, uh, based on the studies, it is as safe as any other overnight modality. Like similar to soft contact lenses. Now you could say these scientific things and you'd be right, you know, based off of the studies, based off of the research, orthokeratology and soft multifocal contact lenses, atropine, especially in the dilute form, are very safe. But patients don't really quite understand that. Now, if you say this instead, I'll give you an example of what I do. I cheat. A patient might ask um, if they're on atropine, for instance, well, is, is putting drugs in my kid's body, like, is that a good idea? Or how long have we been doing that? Is that like FDA approved? They might be like, I don't know, doc. Like, so how would you communicate to them that it is safe? I do, I communicate that in subtle ways sometimes. And a lot of times they don't even ask this question because I've already dropped little hints that it's safe. So they don't even ask that question. I'll give you an example. That's my son, Jacqueline, right there on the right. I'm measuring his axial length. And because uh, he's on atropine, because he's like, daddy, I'm a minus nine. And, and Jackson is currently um, Plano. I'm trying to keep him that way. But he's got a big eye. He's almost 24 millimeters. So anyways, I'm treating him with atropine right now. So I'll tell a patient, oh, yeah, my son Jackson is on it. And uh, let's say I, I intend to prescribe atropine. And the patient hasn't even asked questions if it's safe or not, I might just say, oh yeah, uh, well, I'm going to recommend, uh, you know, atropine for little Sarah, you know, uh, she sure, should do quite well. It's very easy to put the drops in. My son Jackson does it um, every night as well. And it, 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 there's, there's never been any issues. I just drop little hints like that because indirectly I'm communicating that if I'm doing it on my own kids, it has to be safe. Or I, at least I believe with every fiber of my being, that it is safe. Otherwise, why would I do it on my own son? And so patients get that. And since I've said that and preempted it before they even ask the question, is it safe? Or if they're doing orthokeratology, my son doesn't do orthokeratology, but my nephew does, my sister does, my friends do. And so I'll mention that as well in passing. It indirectly answers the question if it's safe or not, because I do it on friends and family. So part of your communication is just doing subtle things like that, that are a little bit elevated in terms of appeals to emotion than to the logic of, you know, the Bullimore studies. Now, for the engineer, for, for the type A mom that wants it, yeah, bring up the Bullimore studies then. <laughs> so remember, you communicate to the well, to the level that they want you to communicate at. When you have that parent, talk about it at that level, and then, um, then they'll be happy. And email them studies, they'll be happy. But for most patients, they are more, they're more, they're less logic-based. And they're more just the fact that, yeah, okay, must be safe you're doing it on your own kids. Know that sometimes patients can get hung up on costs. But remember, what, can, what people sometimes don't realize 
it is a cost of inaction. And the cost of inaction of doing nothing is much worse than pursuing my opioid management, in my opinion. The cost of just letting it go and waiting, letting it progress, the fact that it is irreversible once the eye grows longer, that has consequences. So you need to communicate the consequences of inaction to show that the cost of inaction exceeds the cost of whatever you might be recommending. If you're recommending my site contact lenses for a patient, um, the cost of not doing these lenses is much worse, which is irreversible myopic progression. Know that the person who's most confident will close the case best. So if you're a doctor and you're, try and you're trying to influence patients, for instance, most patients will respect the white coat a lot. So if you, if you are the one that's kind of going to mention it, by the way, yes, I recommend this for you. I want to see you back in a couple of weeks. It's usually a little bit stronger than your staff doing it. Now, at the same time, let's say you're a doctor that kind of hates the you know, feeling of rejection, just doesn't like to appear too salesy, things like that. You, know, you don't want to recommend things in a strong way. Then I wouldn't do it if I were you. I, I would hand it to the person who has the strongest conviction and believes that what you're doing is best for that child. If you truly believe or whoever you have on your staff truly believes what's best for that child, they're going to have the conviction, they're going to be confident, and that person is going to have the patient actually pursue treatment. I would do the assumptive close, which what it means is that don't ask, well, do you want to do this now? That's kind of weird. Just assume they're going to do it and say, yeah, I'm going to recommend, let's say, orthokeratology. Want to see uh, little Johnny back in two weeks to pick up the lenses. We'll train him how to take in and out the lenses. We'll take care of all the work. You don't have to do anything yourself. You don't do, you need to do barely any prep work. Don't worry, we'll take care of the training and uh, get the lenses and do everything in the office. Patients want a plan. You're, you're going to tell them the plan. So you're going to tell them the plan is, you know, the plan is that we're going to watch Sarah closely over the next couple of years when she's going the quickest. We'll be checking regularly on her for any signs of myopia progression. They want to know that you have a plan. So talk about the plan. Talk about the fact that this isn't just something you're going to do this month. It's, it's a long-term relationship. You need to communicate to the fact that there will be a lot of follow-up visits and they will be part of not just getting an eye exam, but now they're part of more like a program. I would communicate what you recommend also in a report card. Similar to going to the pediatrician, you get like a growth chart. Similarly to going to school, they get a report card. Know that kids are getting report cards all the time. They're, also, they're always getting notes in terms of how they're doing. Why should it be any different in terms of what you do in your office? When you're communicating what you do in the office, you could talk about doing classes for insertion and removal training instead of just doing, for instance, a, a uh, um, training, you know, because people are used to taking lessons and passing classes. So can we, I like to communicate at that level because kids are used to it. I like to give them a report card of what the level of myopia is what we might project it to be. So mom has some information to hand to dad when they walk home. We like to have folders that have all the stuff in it with them. It has the contracts, brochures, the report card. So that mom has some, some you can do this either by printing out or you can even email them these things. You know, you can have digital as well. But the goal is that they leave with something that communicates what you recommend it and why. Know that a lot of people will not sign up no matter what. And that's fine. But the fear of rejection is a little bit overblown. I recommend letting it go. If they have to think about it, that's okay. You know, lots of people have to think about it because the information is sometimes you've just communicated to them. It's just too new for them to really pursue treatment. It's a little bit um, outside of what they're used to hearing. And so I recommend a lot of post-communications afterwards. Let's say they don't follow through with your recommendation. That's fine. I would call them at least 10 times a day for next year until they finally sign up. Just kidding. Um, I wouldn't do it that much. That's a little bit too much. <laughs> but I'll at least call them a couple of times and just see if, you know, hey, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Mai recommended doing my way management. Uh, any questions I can answer um, in terms of how what your staff would do to follow up? The goal is to have them not on the fence. Being on the fence is not good for anyone. You want to either have them say no or yes by asking them a couple of times afterwards. And that's okay. And if you do these things, if you first of all change the way you communicate, First, to yourself. Your, what you say, the words you say to yourself are powerful. For instance, studies show that we are very negative towards ourselves. For every one positive thought about ourselves, we have five negative thoughts. If you even change your internal monologue and have five positive thoughts for every one negative thoughts, then you're going to change who you are and what you believe in and what you do and what you stand for. If you change what you believe in and who you stand for, 
then patients always pick that up. They know when a person truly cares. They know when a person has conviction that they're trying to help them with every fiber of their being without any financial motive or incentive or anything strange like that. So when you fix that internal monologue of why you do what you do, that's the most important communication you need to have. The second is the staff next needs to have believe what you believe. They need to believe what myopia management is and why it's a problem if you don't manage myopia, how it's an epidemic in children and how you need a nip in the bud. And lastly, your patients need to believe what you believe. You need to communicate with them multiple times at their level, at their level of communication, either verbally, either electronically, either on YouTube videos, either by sending them an ebook or just telling them in the office, what you tell them during the pretest, what you tell them after they leave the office or on the phone, all those things are important so the patients believe what you believe. And that's the end of the lecture. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can always email me directly.